Leaders of the Crow Nation, 1400 to 2005. The following is an educational program about the leaders of the Crow Nation from 1400 to 2005. Many cultures retain their history and memories by telling and retelling the information in the form of stories. The stories are passed down from one generation to the next. This is called oral history. We will cover the pre-reservation tribal leaders and tribal structure of the Crow Nation. We will discuss how chiefs attain their status, the chiefs of the Crow from 1400 to 1932, and the tribal structure including the owner of the camp and the three bands, the River Crows, the Mountain Crows, and the Kicked in the Bellies. We will discuss the early reservation tribal leaders and government, the Crow man and the Crow woman's substitution skills, the Indian agents, and Robert Yellowtail as the first Crow Indian superintendent from 1934 to 1945. We will cover the post-reservation tribal leaders and government, the 1920 Crow Act, the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, the 1948 Tribal Constitution, the 2000 Constitution, the Chairman of the Crow Nation, from 1920 to 2005, and hear from current Chairman Carl Van. Six knowledgeable Crow members will share their knowledge. Brief introductions to follow. Our first presenter is Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, who was appointed the official tribal historian by the Crow Tribal Council. His Indian name is Highbird. He is a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Tribe. One of the presenters in this segment is Dr. Barney Old Coyote, known as Young White Buffalo Bullcalf, a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Tribe. Dr. Old Coyote is a founder and member of the Crow Cultural Committee. Our third presenter is Elias Goes Ahead, known as Knows How to Pray. He is a member of the Ties the Bundle clan. Elias is the bilingual teacher for the prior public schools. David Stort Sr. is another presenter. His crow name is Stays on the Mountain, and he is a member of the Greasy Mouth clan. David is retired from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and is a former chairman of the Crow Tribal Council. Another presenter is Angela Russell, whose crow name is Outstanding White Woman. Angela is a member of the Big Lodge clan. She is a former representative to the Montana State Legislature and a former Lodge Grass District representative to the Crow Tribal Legislature. Crow Tribal Chairman Carl Van's Crow name is one who crosses the Big River and becomes a leader. He is a member of the Ties the Bundle clan. Carl is currently the chairman of the Crow Nation. Before the Crow people lived on reservations, warriors who wanted to attain the status of a chief had to achieve, by merit and witness, four recognized and well-established war deeds. They were one, county coup, two, taking an enemy's weapon, three, capturing a picketed horse from within an enemy camp, and four, leading a war party. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow will discuss how this system worked. We have these so-called leaders, various titles like emperors, rulers, chiefs, and, uh, and other terms. And here in the Indian country, <coughs> let's say the crows, we use the word Baje Itche, good man. But the white man has come along and say, chief, the word chief. It's not an Indian word, the white man make that a chief. So in describing our leaders to the crows, <coughs> here's the way our leader <coughs> leaders become chiefs, what they check. And ours is <coughs> based on our our culture, which is militaristic. Have to go through <coughs> completing four military requirements, all defying death. These don't come in any particular order. And let's say there's a battle <coughs> beginning. Sioux on one side, Crow on one side. And the first warrior on each side is, has fallen, shot off his horse or accidentally 
fallen knees on foot. And he becomes a trophy, so to speak. And let's say a crow warrior or warriors <clears throat> want to go there and touch that fallen enemy with what we call a coup stick. Sometimes if they don't have one handy, they use a court or their, one of their arrows. You know? Touch that fallen enemy without killing him or hurting him and come back. That entitles a man a one war deed. And that's called counting coup. That's the coup, it's a French word. <clears throat> Means a deed. And uh, the Crow word for that is Dakshe de Tour. Dakshe means enemy, fallen enemy. De Tour means hit or touch. Dakshe de Tour. Now let's say <clears throat> during the battle, two warriors confronted each other and they started wrestling and uh, <clears throat> hand to hand encounter. And during the process, Let's say the crow warrior had <clears throat> taken the man's rifle or <clears throat> tomahawk or his weapon away from him and uh, either let him go or kill him there, a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. But anyhow, subdue him. You get another war deed, especially taking the weapon away from him, you know. And the third one. <clears throat> is uh, to go on a horse raiding expedition <clears throat> and go into the enemy country looking for an enemy camp and they see one while they start making plans to go in there <clears throat> that night, especially nighttime. Go in there and move those logs, cut that rope, take that horse up, you get a good war deed. Pashto huko, ijin pashto, ijin horse. Pashto means cut, cutting the halter rope. Ijin, so you get a good war deed for that. All right, the fourth one, after having completed several of these, the fourth one, the retired old warriors would uh, adv generally advisors to the main leader or the head chief would select you to lead a war party into the enemy country in search of horses or war deeds. So they, he was chosen. He's a commander. <clears throat> they call him pipe carrier because they take a sac sacred white pipe with them. <clears throat> so they go out there and, and he's in charge. And if you come back without losing any of your men and had brought back war deeds, then they give you a deed, another one. Those four determine <clears throat> a man becoming a, <clears throat> a, a, a chief, a good chief. A crow chief was called Bajaycha, the good man, as a mark of social prestige and in recognition of the four achievements. We will discuss two crow chiefs from the early crow history. They are Sheep Dada, no intestines, because he was the first leader of the people who would become the crows. And Izagiwan Nya plays with his face because he was one of the most renowned crow warriors. We will also discuss four crow chiefs from more recent history. They are Ave Kulawaj, sits in the middle of the land, because he signed the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, establishing Crow Country at 38 million acres. He also signed the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which reduced Crow lands to 8 million acres and formed the first reservation. Dehkashitchish, pretty eagle. Pelachuachbash, medicine crow. And Alachchiohush, plenty cool because they attained the status of chiefs in the traditional manner and lived to become reservation chiefs. Plenty Ku, who died in 1932, was the last Crow chief. No intestines, because of his vision of the tobacco plant, decided to leave what they, what, as they call it, decided to leave camp and go search for it. And he had his followers. So he was the leader of that first band 
But they were not crows yet. They were still Hidatsa. So he led the the uh, initial group, which was Sa now, the one who was leading us. Because he's the one that had, had the vision. He was like a map reader, played with his face. He was one of the, as the crows say it, the crazy people. Crazy meaning that they were reckless, that they were so brave that they did not know the word fear. So that uh, plays with his face, Izagi Wanya was credited for being so fearless that other tribes would come and try to in, uh, inject themselves into Crow country and he'd chase them away almost single-handedly because he would not hesitate to ride into, the mid into their midst and fight them even though they outnumbered him. These young men would uh, test their uh, versatility by going up to a buffalo bull and see if they could tie a ribbon around his knee and get away. What's so outstanding about that? It's a wild buffalo. Having the bravery and the technique and the skill to go sneak up on it, tie a ribbon. Then they say, the one that played with his face, and sneak up on the buffalo bull and come up alongside and play with his face and run before he got hurt. And then whoever did that named him, gave him that name. And my understanding was this, it was one of his clan elders. Sits in the middle of the land was in the chain of a, of a line of great chiefs. He's the first Crow Indian who was recognized as a chief by the Crows and by the U.S. government both. He's the one that crossed over the line, who uh, acceded to the U.S. government, says we'll be friends forever kind of thing. So he signed the Treaty of 18, 1851 and 1868. He's my grandmother's father, Pretty Eagle. He was uh, one of the uh, great warriors of the Crow tribe back at the, in the, at the turn of the century. And just about that period, uh, he was a chief, in fact, one of the last chiefs of the Crow tribe, his uh, vision quest site on the Bighorn Mountains. And that's where his remains are today. Chief Medicine Crow. He belonged to the Mountain Crows. He was born about 1848. And <clears throat> he fasted that uh, crazy mountains once, on prior mountains once, in some place in Wyoming, he fasted about three times and received uh, strong powers. So before too long, he was a, a chief by age, well, by age 1920, he had completed those four dangerous war deeds, already a chief. He, he had over 20 war deeds. He died in 1920, 20, Around 20, I think. Ignabuche is a kale, a rechter, which can is a kale, but the gubum can yuchazake, and a panic of yuchazake, a taje, a kogreku, a spare, babko, spare lavi, sure state. Kogan, <laughs> Absalaga, he was the first crow to have a two-story house. Some had uh, had better records, war records. Had, uh, uh, diplomatically, uh, they won't know he had no equal. Him, he was he. We, the crows could have not had a better uh, leader than Plenikoops himself. He's buried on uh, park grounds uh, uh, over at uh, uh, Plenikoops State Park. Now, we will discuss the tribal structure during the pre-reservation period. The principal chief was called Asheage, or owner of the camp. Each band had a chief, but when all bands gathered for any reason, he was the main chief. There were three bands of the Crow Nation, the Mountain Crows, 
the river crows, and they kicked in the bellies. We will continue as Dr. Old Coyote tells us what the owner of the camp was and where each band lived. We will include a short explanation of how the kicked in the bellies got their unusual name. Ajayaga, that meant the principal chief. He was, he was at the top. He was a head man. With the crow, once you earned your place, you were given wide berth. Nobody stepped in front of you. Nobody tried to talk ahead of you. When the chiefs got together, the one with the highest prestige didn't even have to campaign. The others would say, let's let him lead because he has the most honors. Why? The honors came by way of good fortune. They earned their way. They were good leaders. They were good warriors. They were good, good to people. All the other chiefs acceded to him for his final judgment. All the other chiefs were his advisors. Crow country, as I interpret it, it's the mountain range beginning over there in the vicinity of Bozeman, Montana, around Three Forks, following the mountains to the eastern edge, which is down here by Cloud Peak, by the Tongue River. And then on the south, it goes into the Bighorn Basin. And the river crow lived along, primarily along the Muscle Shell and the Yellowstone, going down the river. And then a little bit to the south and into the Bighorn Basin, where they kicked in the billies. The mountain crow, they ranged anywhere from this part of the country, from along the Bighorn, the Bighorn Mountains all the way west to uh, what is now called Three Forks. It was in terms of keeping others away from what they called our mountains. And uh, when you look at it, the mountain crows protected it from the west and to the north or the river crow to the north and to the east, and they uh, kicked in the bellies to the east and to the south. So that's where they generally roamed, and they went back and forth very easily, and uh, it's hard to say this is where they were. They kicked in the bellies, they ate in the bill. On all the stories that we've collected, Amidage means on the other side of the mountain, over in the basin area, that's what they were called. One of the stories that uh, keeps popping up is that uh, being next to the southern tribes, they always had good horses and they had uh, good forage so that their horses did not need the whip or any urging. All you had to do was just nudge them in the, in the stomach. Ate it a bill, ate it a bear, and they were off and running. And then there's another story that says that uh, as, a, as, a, as a young man, one of the more renowned leaders of the tribe, uh, reached around and grabbed the tail of a of a young colt, and the colt kicked him in the belly, and they said those kicked in the belly is his band of people. So there are many stories to it, but the most prevailing one that I know is one that uh, characterizes the good horses they had. The first Crow Indian Reservation was established in the Treaty of 1851. The first agency was located near Livingston, Montana from 1869 to 1875. It was moved near the present-day town of Absaroke, Montana from 1875 to 1884. By 1884, all three Crow bands moved to their present reservation east of Billings, Montana. Men in the Crow tribe developed ways to replace the warrior skills that were no longer needed now that they lived on the reservation. Crow women remained the solid foundation of family life while the old chiefs struggled with the Indian agents who challenged their authority. From 1851 to 1917, the Indian agents hired under the Department of War governed the reservation. By 1917, superintendents under the Department of the Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, were hired to oversee the trust responsibilities of the federal government on Indian reservations. In the meantime, educated young new leaders such as Robert Yellowtail who was appointed the first Crow Indian superintendent of the Crow Indian Agency in 1934, became leaders of the tribe. Yellowtail would also be elected as Crow Tribal Chairman from 1946 to 1954. Doctors Medicine Crow and Old Coyote explain. The chief sits in the middle of the land, said, I know what they're going to do now. They're going to make you quit <clears throat> traveling around, roaming around. They're going to make you quit fighting each other. 
They're going to put you in certain areas that you cannot go out anymore. And the game's going to be gone soon now. They're going fast. So you're going to have to learn how to work and provide <clears throat> livelihood for your family by farming. Treaty of 1868 set up the reservation system and the government appointed an Indian agent. He was a boss. His word was the law. So that left these young, inspiring young chiefs with no authority at all, no prestige. But among the more significant factors that entered into the picture is that all of a sudden, he could no longer go on war parties, uh, which was the most prestigious thing was leading to chieftainship. The second was that be a prime provider for not only his, his own home, but for families that are dependent on him and the so-called uh, extended family. And then also the, the role that he played uh, was no longer as important to the community as it was before because he was a kingpin. He had to be an able warrior, a wise leader, a brave man, strong man, and all these things. And then all of a sudden, uh, the pursuits that made him a key person were gone. And uh, the reservation was a bad time for the Crow man because uh, he had to search for new ways to be accepted by his, not only by his peers, but by the people themselves and to find a role for him. So this was a most difficult time. Oftentimes they served as allies, regular fighting for men. It all started in 1825 when a treaty commission had come up the Missouri making treaties with the various tribes along the river. But ever since that time, 1825 to the present time, the Crow tribe has always cited or helped the United States government in its various uh, military activities with other nations. So we've been doing that all these years. Oftentimes books say Crow Scouts. These were not scouts, they were fighting men. So they form a, a company, 138, um, about 130 or 40 Crow Indian soldiers. They were soldiers. The reservation agency was moved over this way in 1884. Once they got here, that's what <clears throat> uh, farming really <clears throat> took place now. The first <clears throat> farming effort was a communal <clears throat> program there where Gary owned Montana is now. But they had to raise hay first, put that, <clears throat> plant the alfalfa, raise hay, and uh, they would take their hay to the fort up there near Hardin, Fort uh, Custer. So <clears throat> they were <clears throat> selling hay. Then, of course, they started uh, planting uh, wheat and oats and, of course, uh, uh, garden produce, potatoes, corn, and so forth. So it all started there, and they started farming. But it was not easy because the Crow Indian man <clears throat> believed that his job was to hunt and protect the camp. And it was <clears throat> not acceptable to him to plow, say, at the turn of the century, 1900, why? <clears throat> These, uh, <clears throat> the older chiefs who were still there, like Medicine Crow, Black Hair, Two Leggings, uh, Plenty of Coos, these others uh, have to go to Washington, D.C. quite often to deal with the <clears throat> government there over tribal affairs. And they would take young men who are just now returning from attending uh, government boarding schools like Haskell, Carlisle, Sherman Institute, Chamawa, they started coming back, educated. And now most of them were breed persons like Jim Carpenter, half-breed, Joe Cooper, and uh, Arnold Costa, 
There's quite a few uh, uh, breed boys. Then, of course, uh, other crows like Harry White Man and uh, Robert Yellowtail, and uh, they were the young men who were pretty good with both languages. So whenever the old, remaining old chiefs had to go to Washington, they would take uh, one or two of these young, educated uh, <clears throat> crows along as interpreters, see? So they worked together pretty good. With the death of Plenty Coup in 1932, the era of leadership through death-defying warrior deeds was over. Educated young men like Robert Yellowtail and others had been assisting the old chiefs in dealing with the U.S. government and had begun taking the reins of leadership long before Plenty Coup's death. In this age of new leadership, there were important tribal and federal government documents which would propel the nation into the modern era. We will discuss the Crow Act of 1920, the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, and the 1948 and the 2000 tribal constitutions, which the Crow tribal members wrote and adopted. We will review the documents and tribal government structures to show the changes made in the Crow Tribal Council. The U.S. government, early cattle barons, and surrounding communities always thought the Crows had too much land. In 1852, a treaty with the U.S. government had recognized 38 million acres as Crow country, but the Treaty of 1868 reduced Crow lands to a total of 8 million acres. By 1871, the U.S. government no longer made treaties with the Indian tribes, but made agreements. Several more of these agreements were made with the Crow Nation, further reducing their lands. By 1889, at least 34 million acres of land had been lost. In 1920, the leaders of the Crow Nation wrote and passed an act which still protects what is left of Crow country. It was called the Crow Act of 1920, a comprehensive legislation for the administration and preservation of Crow reservation lands. Although there was more reduction of Crow lands, the remaining two and one quarter million acres of Crow reservation is still protected by the 1920 Crow Act. It was a major step for the Crow Nation. In summary, the 1920 Crow Act distributed lands to heirs of tribal members since the 1887 Dawes Allotment Act, which allotted 160 acres to each head of family, 80 acres to single persons over 18 years of age, and 40 acres to each child under 18 years of age. Surplus Indian lands were to be sold, but most of these land sales were never made. All Crows born after the Dawes Act remained unallotted until the 1920 Crow Act divided all remaining Crow lands equally among every Crow tribal member born before June 5, 1920. This was done to prevent the U.S. government from taking any more land which they considered as surplus. There are two very important sections of the 1920 Crow Act. Section 2 restricted the amount of acreage sold by a Crow Indian to any person, company, or corporation. There were severe penalties for violations, even imprisonment. Section 6 protected the mineral rights of reservation lands. Additionally, the 1920 Crow Act dealt with lands for recreational, educational, administrative, and religious purposes. It provided administration of enrollment, prohibition of liquor, homesteads, irrigation systems, and per capita payments from tribal natural resources. It also created an open forum known as the Crow Tribal Council, where all adults were allowed to speak and vote on tribal matters. The young leaders preserved what remained of Crow country. The next issue was how they would govern themselves. The Crow leaders governed the tribe as best as they could, but they were never recognized as an official entity by the U.S. government. However, this would change when Congress passed the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act under Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. The Indian Reorganization Act was designed to finally recognize Indian tribal governments and was introduced to all Native tribes for acceptance. Most importantly, Section 16 of this Act stated, any Indian tribe or tribes residing on the same reservation shall have the right to organize for its common welfare and may adopt an appropriate constitution and bylaws, which shall become effective when ratified by a majority vote of the adult members of the tribe. In 1934, Robert Yellowtail was appointed the superintendent of the Crow Indian Agency. Although he urged his people to adopt the Indian Reorganization Act, they rejected it. 
Because the federal government was now recognizing tribal governments, the people realized that they must form their loosely organized Crow Tribal Council into a more efficient, structured government with a constitution and bylaws, rules of order, and duly elected officers. The Crow have always seen themselves as being very independent. And of course, we are one of the largest uh, reservations as far as land is concerned. We have a huge land base. And I think there was a real fear that we wouldn't have the say in our government. Uh, so they chose not to accept the Indian Reorganization Act. Uh, under the IRA, uh, many tribes organized and, and they had business councils. We continued to have our big tribal forum, uh, a big general council where all the adult members of the tribe uh, can speak on an issue and can vote. After 14 years of intense tribal debate, the Crow people finally adopted a constitution on June 24, 1948. The 1948 Crow Tribal Constitution reestablished the council to represent, act, and speak for the Crow tribe in any and all tribal matters and to promote the general welfare of the Crow tribe. Most importantly, it set up a legitimate tribal council with all Crow tribal members invited to meet in an open forum and every two years elect a chairman, vice chairman, secretary, and vice secretary. The Constitution stated any duly enrolled member of the Crow tribe, except as herein provided, shall be entitled to engage in the deliberations and voting of the Council, provided the females are 18 years old and the males 21 years. The Tribal Council consisted of the entire membership of the Crow tribe and determined by a majority vote of those attending any course of action taken which was designated to protect Crow tribal interests. Its elected officers were the representatives to deal with the U.S. government and to the public. For many years, Crow tribal members considered the 1948 Constitution and bylaws to be outdated. Several attempts to adopt a new one have been rejected. Finally, in the year 2000, a new constitution was passed by a majority vote. The new Crow tribal constitution's preamble mentions enforcing and exercising treaty rights, sovereignty, and creating a governing body to represent the members of the tribe, to promote the general welfare of the Crow tribe, and to provide for the lawful operation of the government. The traditional name of the government of the Crow tribe of Indians of the Crow Indian Reservation is now the Apsalogan Nation Tribal General Council, known as the Crow Tribal General Council. The Constitution established three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. It states that the council shall meet biannually for the purpose of receiving information from the executive and legislative branches. New provisions included a four-year term for tribal officials, and the age of all adults was changed to 18 years of age, from 18 for females and 21 for males. There are no longer any open forums for all tribal members, but they do meet twice yearly to receive information from the executive and legislative branches. I think it's uh, a step that we have needed to take for some time. I think it's really important to have the new constitution. It's a representative government of the districts, and um, there are six districts and there are three representatives from each district. The Crow Reservation is divided into six districts, Aludasha, Arrow Creek, Pryor, Balewage Asha, Giveaway Valley, Bighorn, Ashibide, Black Lodge, Ishbadawukhabe, Fallen Bell, Reno, Ashpajecha, Valley of the Chiefs, Lodgegrass, Enigo Stagada, The Few, Wyola. The duties of the legislature are that you are elected from your, uh, from your district and uh, you represent them. Uh, you are there at all of the hearings, at all of the uh, deliberations at all of the open the opening session uh, you may have like 10 bills uh, maybe you have 20 uh, you may be sponsoring some of those uh, having a, a discussion uh, as thorough a discussion as you can have on a particular issue you may send it to a committee to further look at uh, different aspects of that piece of legislation then the committee may make may make a recommendation for it to come back on the floor and then you may have deliberations, you may have amendments, and then you either vote it 
forward or you voted out. To conclude this program, we provide a list of tribal chairmen, still referred to as Bajaycha. Ralph Seiko has the distinction of being the first tribal chairman from 1920 to 1921. He was from the Lodgegrass District, also known as the Valley of the Chiefs. Robert Yellowtail, who served as the Crow Agency Superintendent from 1934 to 1945, also served as the Crow Tribal Chairman from 1946 to 1954. He was from the Lodgegrass District. There were only two brothers ever elected as chairman. They were David Stewart, who served from 1972 to 1974, and Donald Stewart, who served from 1982 to 1986. They are both from the Black Lodge District. Clara Nomi was the first female to be elected as Crow Tribal Chairman. She served from 1990 to 2000, a term of 10 years, making her administration the longest. She is from the Lodgegrass District. The present Bajay Chair of the Crow Nation from the Reno District, Crow Tribal Chairman Carl Van will make the concluding remarks. You know, I'm a strong believer in, in my culture and our traditions. I think the bottom line is, and our ancestors had a lot of it through our clansons, is to respect each other. I strongly believe you have to know your history and your culture to really feel for the people and why we're here. History is very important, I feel, because of what our tribe has gone through, that this is our promised land and we fought to maintain it. I think the great chief Plenikus made it clear, without education, you're nothing. And that still stands today. I would like to say to our young people, there's nothing else in this world but to get your education and to make it and to help your tribe. One of the basic things is, the reason that holds this tribe together is the land. We need to buy back all the land we can. I want my young kids to have every right that every American has today, and they shouldn't hang their head low. They should be proud of who they are because of the history and the heritage and where they're from. We have covered the pre-reservation tribal leaders and tribal structure, the early reservation tribal leaders and government, and the post-reservation tribal leaders and tribal government in this program. We would like to thank Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, Dr. Barney Old Coyote, Elias Gozahead, David Stewart Sr., Angela Russell, and Carl Van for sharing their knowledge with us. <laughs>